Hi, in this video, what I'd like to do is talk to you about purchase intention analysis. Now, for any of you that were actually completely caught off guard by the Brexit vote, if you remember that, or when Donald Trump was elected, what that is the result of is the misanalysis of polling data. In the world of machine learning, we often talk about the word bias. And that bias is a very different thing than something called sampling error. So, if you were surprised by Donald Trump's election, or you were surprised by the Brexit vote. After this video, I will guarantee you, you'll never be surprised ever again with any of these kinds of polls or surveys that you might be hearing about on the press. The reason you'll understand it is, there's a very big difference between sampling error and bias. Let's start with sampling error. When you do a sample of a large population and you do it over and over again, you're likely to get somewhat different results. That's because in a random sample, for example, you may end up getting some observations that skew the result. So when they give you polling results on television, they'll typically talk about plus or minus three or four percent. That's the sampling error. That is not the bias. The bias is something very different. And by the end of this video, I'll explain to you how to interpret the, that type of data that's used in machine learning to make predictions. Now, for those of you who never have enough time to do, let's say, a conjoint analysis because it's a bit too slow, maybe too expensive to do that type of analysis, what I'd like to recommend is that you do purchase intention analysis instead. This is a poor man's conjoint analysis. Very quick, very dirty. Now, you may have heard this expression, garbage in, insight out. That's exactly what this is. You know garbage is coming in. You know there's some bias there but that doesn't make it useless. In fact, it becomes very powerful if you understand how to exploit the fact that biases do exist in data. This is what we would call in the world of machine learning a ballpark methodology. You don't know where the ball is gonna fall in the baseball park, but you know it's gonna be either inbounds or out of bounds. When I'm with a group of executives, I'll ask them to raise their hands. I say, listen, anybody here gonna buy some presents for your kids, maybe your spouse or your partner? before you go home, raise your hands if you intend to buy something for your, for your family before you go home leaving the NCAD campus. And a bunch of people will raise their hands. And I'll say, I have just done an intention analysis. I've asked you your intentions. Now the truth is, some of you who just raised your hands, you're actually not going to buy something from your parents. You're gonna take the free gifts from NCAD and the swag that we give away, and you're just gonna give that to your kids because you're just too cheap to buy something on your own. And then I'll say, some of you did not raise your hands. And the truth is, some of you in fact will. The difference between the recorded intention and what actually people do is what we call the bias. You can resample and get the same result, plus or minus three or 4%. But it might be that that methodology results in a bias of up to 20 or 30%. So we're gonna go through that distinction a little bit more in detail as we continue our discussion. So what in the world is intention analysis used for? It's a methodology, typically in supervised machine learning applications, where we estimate the overall market potential for a new product or service or some other idea that we have in mind. Uh, it's been used in a number of different industries uh, and it's, it's used mostly for forecasting purposes. Here's the basic idea. People do what they say they intend to do, however, we need to make some kind of an adjustment because often when people tell you, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll buy your product, there's an inherent bias to the answer to that question. No matter how many times you re-ask the question, the sampling error will be the same, but the bias may be huge in the response to that question. So how do we actually implement intention analysis? Well, the first step is you simply survey people's intentions. Very simply, you ask people, hey, would you likely buy this product or not? Or would you adopt this service or not? Then you interpolate and extract the true probabilities of behavior. And then from there, you do some kind of a market estimate. Now, let's start with some examples of questionnaires. These date back to the original studies from MIT, John Hauser on the narrow band video telephone. So we're looking at the very first generations of technologies way back when, so this is a very old type of uh, methodology, very, very useful. So let's start way back when with the narrow band video telephone. All right, in our first example, we have at the top a very, what I'd like to call a severe type of question format, just as a sample. 
Um, suppose you've already selected this product. You have it. You have this new product. How do you feel about you, what you just did? And people will answer that question. So they might say, I definitely will use it, or maybe I won't. Now imagine people answered it in the following way, zero, 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 and a hundred for a total sample size of 100. What does that tell you about this product? Your product sucks. Is it possible people could come up with ideas that are that bad, where people would invest huge amounts of R&D into a product and would never actually purchase it? Uh, in my experience, the answer is yes, in fact. Uh, a study I was involved in way back when uh, involved the acquisition of a company called Teloes in the United Kingdom. And we surveyed different people in, in Britain and asked them, hey, how likely would you be to adopt cable television service? Now, there was a study floating around that said the adoption rate would be very similar to that in Holland, which has about a 98% penetration of cable television. Well, if it's in Holland that's successful, surely it'll be successful in the UK. After all, the average person in the UK isn't that much different from the people in Holland, the, the logic went. So by extrapolating the data, from Holland, we could come up with a market valuation for the UK. The only problem with that is that maybe the people in the UK don't want cable television service. So using a study that sampled people across a, a given city, um, you simply ask the Brits, hey, would you likely buy a cable television service if we deliver it to you as we described it? And here's the res kind of results we got. Zero, zero, 15, 235 out of 250. People hate this idea. Well, who are the 15 people who said they might buy this product? Well, it turned out to be uh, British households that love watching sports, don't like playing sports, and consume a lot of beer. Well, that's basically 80% of the British population, so it didn't really give us much of a segmentation insight. Why was cable television so bad? After we looked at the data, it became clear. Number one, the British already have very high quality broadcasting services. Number two, they love British language content. They don't necessarily like English language content if it comes from North America. If you tell them we have a lot, we have a lot of channels, you can say there's 40 channels. Well, there's the weather channel. Do the Brits really need a weather channel? Probably not. They know what the weather's like. You'll say, well, we also have the Dutch channel, the Spanish channel, the French channel. Okay, that's interesting, but maybe not so high quality. Oh, but we've got these other English language channels. Well, high quality British television, the Brits have already seen the high quality stuff maybe three or four times. They've seen Monty Python, Holy Grail, so many times they have all the words memorized. So because there's a shortage of British language content and you need to have English content, what can you offer on the cable television service? Well, probably things like Smoke in the Bandits, Dukes of Hazzards, reruns of Gilligan's Islands, and Star Trek. Frankly, the Brits would pay not to have that content, but it goes a little bit farther than that. It's not that they don't appreciate the extra content per se that cable might offer, something actually a bit more uh, culturally specific. It turns out the Brits absolutely love gardening. It's one of the few cultures in the world where on primetime Friday night, people watch gardening shows. Your average Brit actually will name their flowers. They'll walk in and look at their rows. Oh, good morning, Margaret, and say hello to the flowers every day. Then you approach the British household and you say, hey, we're gonna offer you cable television service, and don't worry, we'll dig a ditch, a trench down your street, maybe take out a couple of old oak trees, and then dig a trench through your garden. You'll lose a couple roses, but who cares, and we'll drill a hole through your wall. The Brits hated this idea. It's one of the few countries where they literally organized protest groups, burning tires at the end of the street, stop the freaking cable company. So yes, indeed, intention analyses are a good thing to do when you think that maybe your product isn't something people want to buy. And this kind of simple format is a very severe one because it says, suppose you had the product, would you even use it? The next one below it is I would call a design question. It's more similar to a conjoint. You list a bunch of attributes and you ask the people, how likely would you buy this product if it had the following attributes? What if it was exactly as described? Uh, what if every office had one, uh, et cetera? Now, the way I filled this out, it looks like that if every office had one, that's the only way someone would buy this product, which means you've got to have deep pockets. You have to make sure everyone has the product before anyone would own the product. 
That's called an externalities problem. So this is a this is a great format for design, just to let you know what kind of features you might need to bundle with your product or service. Okay, now let's get to the bias part. If you ever ask people in different regions of the world, how likely are you to buy something? You will discover that some people will say, absolutely, but in reality, they don't. It turns out that SMR, a group in Europe, found that Northern Europeans will say, I will never buy your product, and the Northern Europeans, in fact, do buy the product. You ask Southern Europeans, will you buy this product? And they'll say, absolutamente, and, but they won't buy the product. So we have these different biases. People in Northern Europe, maybe because of the high latitude, lack of sunshine, are just very negative and they don't think they'll buy things, but they in fact do buy things. And the people in Southern Europe are just very happy and just like, so how do we avoid this bias? Now, a lot of people have researched something called cultural universals, things that all cultures tend to have. One of the things that cultures have, no matter where you are, is smiling is kind of a uh, confirmation of being happy or approving of something. Um, gift giving is another cultural universal. Gambling is a cultural universal. So how do we eliminate this cultural bias that might exist in such questionnaires? Because some people might answer it a certain way. Well, the way we do it is you can put odds, 99 out of 100. That's a gambling methodology. People, no matter what culture you are from around the world, tend to all understand odds, the odds of winning or losing. Or in some places, you maybe have gone to an airport bath store a uh, bathroom where you'll notice on the wall these happy face scale. Unhappy, bad service, very happy, good service. That also eliminates cross-cultural biases. Okay, so we can design questionnaires to eliminate some of these inherent biases you have across different people you sample. But more importantly, there's a more inert, uh, inherent bias in such questions. For example, let's say I ask you, you know, taking everything into consideration, how likely are you to buy this new product? And people will fill it out. Let's say they fill it out this way, zero, 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 et cetera, all the way to the bottom, 20 and 80, total equals to 100. Now, what does that tell you about this product? It tells you that this product is, well, probably not a good product. Probably it's a bad product, you know, because people are, no matter who they are, they're really not excited about this product. So you're pretty safe to say within the ballpark, People aren't gonna, are not going to buy this product. Well, let's, let's reverse it uh, a little bit. Uh, what say if you ask the same question, but you get the following, 80, 20, 0, 0, 0, all the way to the bottom for a sample size of 100. What does that tell you about this product? It doesn't tell you it's a home run. Maybe it's a home run. Why is that? Because the biases on purchase intention questionnaires are often concentrated on the positive side, not the negative side. Let's go through the negative side. Why is it that someone would say, no, 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 I will never buy this product, never, and they actually do? Well, one reason is once you launch the product and people see it demonstrated by others, there might be a demonstration effect. So even though they say, no, they won't buy it, society kind of forces them into it. A lot of times they'll say, no, I'll never buy your product because they don't want to answer any more questions in your questionnaire. They think, if I don't want your product, I don't have to deal with you anymore. People hate questionnaires. On the other side, why is it that someone might say, yeah, I'm going to absolutely buy your product. Absolutely, no doubt, I'm going to buy your product. Why would they say that when in fact they're not going to buy it? Well, number of reasons. One is they want to look like they're innovative people. I'm an innovator. Of course, I'll buy your product. Um, another reason that, that they might say that is it's strategic. I want you to launch this product. So yes, I will buy it so I, it gives me the option of buying it later. This is very common in business to business situation for negotiated contracts of high or expensive items. You'll get that kind of bias. What other kind of reasons are there? If someone says, yes, yes, I'll buy your product, it may be that they're looking for social acceptance. And that's a very powerful thing, especially in political polling. If you ask someone, would you like to vote for the most qualified person ever to run for president or someone with a dubious background and I describe it in the most negative way, if I say I want the dubious background, that reflects badly on me. So I might avoid answering that. If we look at election data, whenever you have a poll of a very controversial person, 
back in the late 70s, early 80s, that person was Ronald Reagan. He was cast by the press to be someone who was going to start a nuclear war. He'd had a divorce. He was on his second wife. It's, he was a Hollywood type, etc. You cannot trust Ronald Reagan. And the polls came out that Ronald Reagan was going to lose the election to Jimmy Carter, all of, even outside the error variance, right? The sampling error, uh, error, even outside that range. Jimmy Carter should have won. Who won, in fact? It was Ronald Reagan. In other words, there was a bias in the polls, 8 to 12 percent point differences. That's a substantial difference in a close election. So if it looks socially unacceptable to say, I'm pro-Brexit, people will say they're not pro-Brexit in a questionnaire. That is the bias. Now, here's the cool part. Within methodologies and within product categories, biases are often constant. Meaning, if I can learn what types of biases exist, I can apply them in the next application of that methodology. Let's look at a few examples. Okay, in these examples published by Juster, what we have is a questionnaire that simply asks, how likely would you buy this product? We have two cases, the automobile industry, and we have, let's call them appliances or white goods. Now, if people were quote, unbiased, the line below would be a 45 degree angle line and the intercept would be at the zero, zero point, so to speak. This is why any line with an intercept, an A coefficient, we typically call the A coefficient a bias because it doesn't pass through the origin. Because people who said, I absolutely will not buy your product, 0% probability, well, they should never buy. But some, in fact, do buy. That is called the bias, right? Now, that bias need not be linear, nonlinear. It may depend on many various factors. But the overall idea is pretty simple. The people who say, absolutely, I am going to buy this product. Well, the truth is, maybe only about 50% of them will. And of those who say, I probably will buy, well, maybe less than 50% will buy. So in essence, we have a bias in this first example in automobile. It's rather high at the, uh, at the high end of the scale. The people most confident that they're going to buy, it goes down. But let's look at the appliance one. Now, this is totally garbage data. The people who say, I absolutely want to buy your product, in fact, are less accurate than the people that say, I probably will buy your product. In other words, the bias is extreme at that end of the scale. Now, that is total garbage. Would you ever use this kind of a survey knowing that the, the stuff coming in is that bad, that biased? The answer is, of course you would. Why? As long as you know what the biases are. There's a very interesting book by Kanishio May on the borderless world. Um, he basically espoused that you should do analyses in the homes of people and ask their intentions when you're in the presence of, of the household. Maybe observe their behaviors and then ask them, how likely would you buy a new product or service, right? That that kind of information is of high quality. Well, a European whites good manufacturer that was working with INSEAD asked us to create a scale for them on the probabilities of people actually buying their products, a simple supervised machine learning project. Well, they used what was called an intercept methodology for doing intention analyses. Here's what would happen. There'd be a young couple at a coffee maker, at a coffee machine or a coffee maker. They're debating, they're arguing. Oh my gosh, should we buy, should we not buy? And then they start walking away without taking one of the coffee machines. At that moment, the manager of the store interrupts him and says, excuse me, but, but can I uh, ask you a few questions? I've got here the director of R&D and they would mention the name of the company of the multinational. They say, this is the director of R&D. We want to talk to you about coffee makers, if you don't mind, because we noticed you walked away and you didn't really buy one, and we're developing next generation coffee makers. And some of the people will actually stop and actually say, sure, let's chat about it. Already, you've introduced a type of bias. Well, that's okay, because we know we've introduced it. Okay, and then we have a conversation. And we say, listen, in the parking lot, we've got a, a little stand there where you can test coffee and drink coffee. And would you like to, after your shopping's over, would you like to visit us there? And a certain percent will say, absolutely, that'd be fun, you know? And then after they've done that, they said, you know, 
we've got a mobile laboratory that can take coffee machines into your home and we can have you prepare different types of coffee with our different coffee makers. Would, would you enjoy doing that? Can we, can we arrange that with you? And a certain percent of people will go, whoa, that's gonna be the highlight of the weekend. Yeah, come on home. Let's see what you can do with the coffee makers in my house. Now, do you realize not everyone will let that happen, but a, a certain percent will. Again, we've introduced another bias, but that's okay because we know we've introduced the bias. Then at the end of that process, you ask the households that are part of this study, hey, would you like to buy this new coffee maker we just created that you've been testing? And if 98% of the people don't say yes, it's probably a product failure. Why? Because we know they are going to say yes. All too often, companies will post or present findings based on people's purchase intentions. I did another study in Hong Kong with a large telecommunications operator. They wanted to know if video on demand would have high or low sales potential. Well, they gave it away for free to an entire block of apartment buildings for free, let people use video on demand for a year, and then at the end of it, ask them, hey, would you like to adopt video on demand if we offered this service to you? 70% of the people said yes. Someone leaked that to the press, and in the press it said 70% of people in Hong Kong are gonna, going to probably adopt video on demand. The market potential was huge. They did not control for the bias. When you're looking at two political candidates, it's very simple. You need to simply ask, does candidate A have a negative externality associated with their name when people are asked, will you vote for them? If, it, if people are ashamed to admit they'll vote for a candidate, be it Donald Trump, Ronald Reagan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, doesn't matter. If there's a negative social implication to saying, yes, I'll vote for them, there is inherently a bias in that data. If you say, yeah, European Union sucks, I think we should leave. If it looks like that will be socially unacceptable to say in a questionnaire, people will actually vote the, actually answer the opposite direction. That is the bias. Okay, we now know what biases are all about. It's the difference between what people say they will do and what they will actually do in a systematic way. A number of factors drive that very different than the sampling error. You can resample the same questionnaire over and over again, get the same answers, but if you don't adjust for the bias, you're just gonna get a bad forecast. So here's my advice to you as a summary. Number one, do these as a sanity check for really bad products. A lot of entrepreneurs love what they're doing. Just go out and ask the market if they're gonna do it. It's not a bad forecasting model. Uh, the second thing is often the results from this type of survey are great to distinguish between what you would call the innovators and the laggards, right? The early adopters are gonna be the ones that are being more enthusiastic about it. You might wanna to go to them first, the ones who say, yes, I'll buy this, because they'll give you some positive word of mouth, reducing your advertising cost later. But more importantly, and I wanna leverage the research of a professor, Vicki Morowitz, wonderful researcher who figured out everything you could imagine about purchase intention analyses, merely by asking people their intentions you can change their behavior. Now, that is fascinating because if it's true, and she has been able to prove this as well as others, then this is not about doing statistical forecasting. It's about changing the market. In that respect, you're gonna do these things to track biases for sure. That's why you're gonna do it fairly frequently, but not too frequently. You want to know what those biases are because the next time you do it, you can actually use it, use those biases to better estimate the market, right? Um, it helps you refine concepts as well. It helps you understand, should I change this attribute or that attribute? But more importantly, it lets you remain extremely close to your customer base because it's not a research tool. It's a way of understanding what their intentions are given different configurations of the product. So I'd like to give you a thought experiment. Imagine you have 500 pump buyers, buyers of pumps. Now, people hate filling out questionnaires, right? But let's split them randomly, randomly into two groups, A and B, right? 250, 250. And then you approach only group A. A is hassled because you keep asking them questions. Group B, you leave them alone. Don't ask them a question at all. Totally randomly split, kind of like a randomized controlled trial of sorts, right? So we're not asking group B anything. Group A, we're bugging them. We're just bugging them. 
So we ask them a question, bam, we've got all these different alpha level version, coffee makers and things like that. What's your intention to actually buy something in this space? And you get the intention questionnaire. Okay, perfect. Then you have a beta version and you blast them again with questionnaires. Uh, you know, how likely will you buy this one versus that one, et cetera. Okay. Then you blast them again on the pre-launch version. You just ask them again, what's your intention? Then you blast them on the launch version. You blast, blast, blast group A. Now the reality is you're learning about group A and B, but group A is paying the price. Then you launch the product. Question, who buys more? Group A, the ones that you've hassled, or group B? The answer turns out from the literature, group A. Group A buys more. Maybe they buy 80 and group B buys two. In other words, this is not a survey statistical methodology. It's changing preference structures. So not only am I learning something about the biases in questionnaires and how to better train my supervised learning models, they'll be very well trained, but more importantly, I'm actually affecting revenues. This is not research. It's pre-launch sales. So often when companies, especially business to business, you should think about using this type of analysis because it can affect the outcome of the market itself. And now the reason it, it can has this effect is many people will answer these questionnaires. How often are pump buyers af asked their opinions about next generation pumps? Almost never. And then someone walks up and says, hey, would you like to help us design the next generation pump that you will actually be a co-author of or a co-developer of? Often this types of analysis, this type of analysis is within a forum or a group. So that's it for purchase intention analysis. Basic idea is this, sampling error is that plus or minus 4% you see on television when they talk about polls. Those polls don't adjust for biases. How do we know what the biases are? Look at that same company. How inaccurate was that company in previous elections where you had the same kind of methodology, the same kind of candidates? In many cases, the polls are highly accurate because there is no negative externality between the two candidates. But when one has a very substantial negative externality, the other one may have a very positive externality. Think Jimmy Carter, physicist versus the actor whose code actor was a monkey, a chimpanzee. Which one do you want, the chimp actor or the nuclear physicist person? Who, who do you think is more qualified for president? Well, you're likely to get a biased answer to that type of question. So your challenge is do these questionnaires frequently to learn the biases, feed those back into your model, and then get more accurate forecasts as you gain more experience. Good luck, guys. Bye-bye.